So to finish things up today, I'm going to talk about a case of optic neuropathy and end-stage renal disease and some things that uh, hopefully um, everyone, at least who's seeing patients with end-stage renal disease, which is probably everybody in this room, um, can think about. So this was a 59-year-old uh, man who presented with painless vision loss and disc edema in both eyes. Uh, he had a rapid decline in his vision uh, for about six to eight weeks before he came in to Dr. Degree's clinic. His vision was suddenly very dark and blurry. He couldn't read, he couldn't make out any details, and he couldn't do his daily activities. He had an MRI brain, which was done about three weeks before coming in to see us and didn't show any new abnormalities. And he was seen by his local optometrist who saw disc edema in both eyes and said, ah, I don't know what to do with this, let's send him to neuro-ophthalmology. So his past medical history uh, is uh, remarkable for a chronic disability, um, uh, which is mostly accounted for by his mental illness. He's had multiple issues with schizoaffective disorder, but bipolar features, as well as obsessive compulsive disorder and others. Um, he also has a history of end-stage renal disease, which uh, arose from chronic lithium use. So the lithium helped to control his uh, psychotic features, but unfortunately at the expense of his kidneys, and uh, he actually stopped the lithium about five years before uh, this presentation, but um, he uh, unfortunately had suffered long-term uh, permanent consequences. Uh, his um, nephrologist actually had um, urged him to go on hemodialysis, as we typically do with patients who are on end-stage renal disease, but uh, both the patient and his family declined to continue with hemodialysis for a number of reasons, side effects, and other issues. Um, and so actually, because he was end-stage renal disease and not on hemodialysis, he was essentially placed on hospice, or given the option to be placed on hospice. He stayed on hospice for about six months, and then he really didn't get any worse, which was pretty surprising considering all of the things that were going on in his kidneys not working. Um, so they actually took him off uh, uh, hospice just before he came in to see us. He also had a history of hypertension, had a prior cingulotomy, which was done uh, in attempts to cure his OCD, which did not work. And he also had a long history of chronic knee pain and chronic opiate use, um, which was relevant because he had some changes in his opiate medications prior to coming in for this presentation. On review systems, just the chronic knee pain, as I mentioned, and he had a very poor posture. He was extremely kyphotic. His head was kind of dropped over to the side. Um, and uh, no uh, concerning GCA symptoms. Uh, and then, you know, these are his medications, pretty standard. Um, on examination, his visual acuity was very poor, 2 over 200 in both eyes. His pressures were normal, his pupils were equal, uh, and there was no APD seen. And his visual fields showed the deficits uh, shown here. He had some uh, more in the right than the left eye, superior deficits as well as other peripheral deficits. Um, really the only quadrant where he could kind of make out some, uh, some sight was in his um, lower right quadrant, although that was also kind of inconsistent. And uh, his extraocular movements were normal, there was no nystagmus. Um, on his slit lamp examination, he had dermatoclasis, he also had cataracts bilaterally, and then um, the important feature here was the uh, grade 3 optic disc edema, which was also accompanied by pallor, no disc heme, appeared uh, chronic in nature. And um, obviously with that poor vision, he was uh, not able to do much in the way of color vision testing or stereopsis. And his neuro exam just showed uh, some decreased strength, um, but otherwise essentially normal neuro exam. So I wanted to um, focus on his uh, optic disc photos here, where um, I'm not sure if it projects very well, but you can see there's definitely, you know, some disc edema in both eyes with pallor, more pallor in the left eye. And then you can also see this uh, high watermark line, which really tells us that this is chronic and has been there for some time, you know, probably for at least the six weeks, if not you know, a significant time before that. And then his Goldman visual fields were very challenging to uh, complete because of his central scotomata and he kept losing fixation, but essentially showed altitudinal defects in both eyes. And again, his OCT RNFL just confirms the uh, chronic disc swelling which was observed. 
So our differential diagnosis, um, I actually put the, the thing that we were kind of thinking about the most on top here, which is this uremic optic neuropathy, which I'll talk a little bit more about. It's actually a very rare um, cause. So we also considered other more common things, such as elevated ICP, which we felt was probably less likely in this case, given that his MRI was normal. He also had a, a second MRI, which included the orbits, which again didn't show anything besides a little bit of increased fluid, but nothing to suggest markedly increased intracranial pressure. We also considered um, AION, which again would be more typical to present as a unilateral and then could be sequential bilateral, but not typically both eyes at the same time. And then an infiltrative cause, which again would likely have been detected on MRI. And then um, uh, also because of his kyphosis and he couldn't support his head, we were also thinking about things like myasthenia and nodding head syndrome. But really all signs tended to point towards this uremic optic neuropathy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about ocular complications and end-stage renal disease because it's probably not something that we think about all the time, but uh, something that certainly can come up. So uh, the anterior segment or surface problems are the most common things that we see. And patients come in with red, scratchy eyes. They've got foreign body sensation. They're you know, kind of in your typical dry eye patient category. And they can also present with band keratopathy. And all of these effects are thought to be related to alterations in calcium and phosphate metabolism that happens when you have end-stage renal disease and your kidneys are not able to process those uh, those materials normally. Um, and then we also have some other effects uh, which are kind of va variable. So um, intraocular pressure can actually increase, decrease, or might not change at all. And so it's kind of variable in the literature as far as what happens with IOP. Um, there's also been rare reports of retinal detachments associated with ESRD. And this is thought to be maybe due to fluid shift and would probably represent an exudative retinal detachment. And then lastly, optic neuropathy is um, the most likely cause in this case. So uremic optic neuropathy was actually first reported in the 1880s. Uh, there was a 10-year-old um, girl who came in with a post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis who also had non-reactive pupils, disc edema, and loss of vision. And uh, uh, her um, physician astutely noted that uh, when her renal function recovered, um, her vision recovered as well. And so um, I don't think at the time he coined this uremic optic neuropathy, um, and the article was not in English, so I couldn't read it, but um, that was you know, kind of what he was getting at. <laughs> um, and then uh, there is actually really, even since, the, you know, since that time, not been much in the way of the literature. There's been about maybe a handful of case reports and then this case report here, this is uh, by Winklemeyer, this one actually summarized all of the previous case reports that they could find, which were about 14 cases, and uh, talked about kind of the differences um, between those cases, and they actually proposed a classification system. So in terms of classifying this uremic optic neuropathy, um, there's the first category, which is the uremic optic neuropathy itself, meaning there's no other, uh, other cause or other um, etiology that could be inferred. And then we also have um, uremic, we, ha we also have optic neuropathy associated with ischemia, which can be associated in cases of uremia. And then we can also have problems due to adverse drug effects, elevated ICP, and uh, cerebral infarction. And this table uh, from Winklemeyer's article just kind of summarizes those classifications and the types of diagnostic clues that you would look for to lead you in one direction or another. And then also the suggested treatment, which typically amounts to dialysis and corticosteroids if an infectious etiology can be ruled out. Again, from this article, summarizing those 14 cases, one of which they had presented in the article, uh, the majority of cases did undergo dialysis here, and uh, about half of them also underwent uh, corticosteroid treatment, and about half had some reversibility of their vision loss, which um, brings home the point that um, this should be recognized early and uh, should be treated appropriately if it is suspected. So when do we suspect this? Any, any patient that has either known uremia or previously diagnosed uremia who's presenting with vision loss 
or pupillary changes or both. And again, the treatment, as I mentioned, dialysis and then also a corticosteroid, oral corticosteroid taper is recommended. But we really don't know enough about this condition to say that this is the you know, be all end all of how to treat it. So if we return back to our patient for just a minute, uh, we of course recommended dialysis in our patient, but again, as he was adverse to dialysis before finding out that his vision was lost, we thought he might change his mind, but he was not not interested. Uh, we actually referred him back to his nephrologist to talk about some other options, but uh, couldn't really come up with much there. So we said, okay, next step is to try some corticosteroids. But again, he's got psychiatric disease that's been well controlled on a number of psychiatric medications. We knew that there was a potential to worsen that. Um, so we had a discussion with both his uh, brother, who is a psychiatrist here at the university, and his, um, his psychiatrist, and came up with a way to increase his psych medications and try to get him the steroid taper. So he did undergo steroids for a short period of time, but he had no change in his vision, unfortunately, and he ultimately succumbed to complications of his uremia at two months. So that is my case, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm.